Welcome everyone. I'm glad you're all here. Uh, we're going to, as always, we're going to pray for another church in town. Uh, today we're going to pray for North Point Fellowship, which is actually transitioning their name. They're going to be Harvest Bible Church within the next year. And their pastor, Paul Meldrum. Uh, I was kind of gone, as most of you know, for about a month, and I kind of missed out. But he's actually had, uh, found out that Paul had cancer. And so we're going we're gonna to lift him up as his fellow brothers and sisters. He had a form of lung cancer. I think they're very positive about it. They said it's kind of the the best kind you can get is detected early, but I still think lung cancer is bad, really bad. So we love them dearly. So if you're the praying type, join me and we'll pray for Paul and the Northwood Fellowship and all start coming together. God, thanks um, for the gift of being together in Flagstaff. God, thanks for the community in this room, the community of this entire town. God, thanks that we are surrounded uh, by family that is trying hard to figure out what it looks like to follow you, Jesus, and to to live in your unconditional love. Thanks for Paul. God, thanks for his faithful service at North Point over the years and even before that with his EV Free Church. God, I just pray that you uh, let him know how loved he is by his family there and by our family here and all around this town. We love him. God, we just pray that you be with him and his family in this difficult time. God, we hate cancer. And you know that. Uh, and we just give him to you. We trust you. You're a good father. We thank you for the good reports that there's hope and just pray that you uh, let that be good news that we can all celebrate together and just bless their entire community that they'll experience your joy and your love. Pray also, God, as we open your word today, will you open our eyes and ears to see what you might have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, that's a big deal to us. Uh, if you're visiting here, this is something I say every single Sunday, so those that aren't visiting get sick of it, but that's really important to who we are as a church, that we're just a part of a much bigger broader thing. It's not just this people here. So we're excited about that. Now, I was wondering, uh, it's, it was family weekend at any of you. I don't know if any families are still around uh, that came here today. So if you're here visiting with family weekend, welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, did anybody go to the NAU football game yesterday? <laughs> Suck it. it was an amazing game. I didn't go. Was there literally only two of you that went to that game? I saw pictures. It was packed. It was a packed house. I'm starting to question if this is the right community for me. <laughs> What's wrong with you people? Yeah, it was supposed to be an amazing game. I was watching my phone as they, they scored a touchdown with 21 seconds left. That was pretty sweet. That was fun. And then uh, the NFL was all fun today, but I won't, I'll spare you the, the football fantasy football stuff today. Just once. I'll give you mercy there. Uh, but it is a beautiful time of year. It's the season that you know if you've been here before. I get a little bit giddy about fall. But I found somebody in my life who is more fired up about the changing leaves than I am. And it's my daughter, Sierra. So this is really cool. This is something that I think we can all learn from. In fact, this is probably the most valuable point of the whole message you're going to get today. You might as well lean in for this. So I get to pick her up. I pick up all the kids on a big rotation because we're terrible at planning our life as a train wreck. And all of our kids go to different schools. It's just a nightmare. But anyway, Sierra is the first kid that I pick up in the afternoon. I pick her up at 2.30. And she gets in the car. And as we drive along, every time she sees a tree that has color on it, she loses her mind. She's like, there's another one! That one's got color on it too, but it never gets old to her. And I think that we all need to be a little bit more like that. I don't know when it became cool for us to not freak out about the fact that trees, for no reason whatsoever, change into crazy fire colors. I think it's pretty great. So we need to be like Sierra on that. Now, today I'm gonna to tell you a story from my other daughter though. This is Aspen. In fact, Aspen is kind of good luck in our crazy life. She has a soccer game about 100 yards that way right now. She's getting her shin guards on. So she's not here so I can trash her behind her back. So, <laughs> Aspen is a little writer. She likes to write books. In fact, she writes a book almost every morning when she wakes up before school, which is something else we should take a lesson from. She will write a book before we go to school. <laughs> This is, the, this is the book I, I have it here, and I have hopefully some slides. I don't know if you would see them in that, with that light on there. I'm going to read this book to you by asking. This is called The Girl Who Never Listened to Me. By, by asking. The inside cover it says, To My Mom. I don't know if you have that slide. Did you take that slide? No, you didn't get that one. Didn't say to Dad. I'm bitter about that. But this is for Mom. <clears throat> Once upon a time, there was a little girl who never listened. Instead, she, she said, you're not in charge of me. A sassy, hypothetical little girl. Next page. One day, her mom said, everybody out of the house. And she said, you're not in charge of me. And fire came in, but she was never seen by me. Psychotic, 
my parents now. <laughs> so in some way, influence that. But I blame the teachers. I think they teach that you'll be consumed if you don't let somebody the flames. <laughs> you know, she didn't get graphic. I liked it. It was kind of subtle. Like, you're not exactly. She didn't explicitly say what happens at the end. She just wanted to see me, and she could have escaped. And all that stuff. I'm pretty sure she burned alive. <laughs> If you haven't been here, we're in a whole new discussion. We've been, we've been started, we started this whole thing where we're going, uh, looking at narrative. Um, and kind of just to give you a little bit of backdrop, very quickly, if you haven't been with us the last few weeks, what we started doing is saying, hey, the Bible's really weird and amazing and deep and hard to understand. And one of the ways of understanding it is the whole narrative arc that ties the 66 books together. From the beginning to the end, there is this sort of meta-narrative, there's like a big story, there's sort of this message that ties it all together, that is the story of God and us, and it is specifically our story. And last week, you know, she, you know, Aspen wrote a little narrative there, and it, it ultimately had to do with sin, maybe, right? What we might think of sin, not listening to somebody. And uh, today, we're going to kind of get to that part of the story. Last week, we began at the beginning, and we looked at creation. And I spent a pretty good chunk of time talking about my opinion that I think that this earth is really, really old, and the, the evolutionary processes are beautiful, and I challenge you to meet me up at Lowell afterwards, because it was free, and I saw a ton of you up at Lowell Observatory, and I thought it was a sweet time of just discussing and looking at images from Hubble Telescope. It was amazing to think that the truth, and this was the, the one-second version of last week's message, the truth that is in the Genesis narrative, the absolute inspired truth was this. You are spectacularly made. Remember we read that John Milton quote? I got another one for you today because I love beating over the head with ancient poetry. And uh, there's a, that, that quote that Satan was looking at the humans and he was silenced in awe of what God had made. That we are actually something spectacular because God's image is in us. So that sets the stage for the whole narrative. That's why it's chapter one of this whole thing. And, and kind of the framework we're using, just to remind you, is that it's almost as if the Bible is, is a lost Shakespearean play. And we found it. And it has four acts that come up through. And it's this idea of creation and what we're going to talk about today, sin and fall. And then the story of this people, Israel, and the climax, which is Jesus. And then there's this thing that we live in, this 2,000 years where we're acting out the play. We're trying to figure out how to be faithful to the four acts that have come before us in the climax of Jesus. And we know where it's all headed, redemption. But we had to start at the beginning. We had to set the stage that we were created spectacular. And most important for today is that we were created to enjoy God and to be enjoyed by God. That's the real deal. That's what you were made for. Face-to-face -face relationship, walking with a garden, to be filled up with the only thing that can truly fill us up, connection with God. That's how the story began. Today it's going to get crazy because this is where the story becomes a story. See, it's not just a story. Nobody goes to a movie to see a story that has no conflict in it. Nobody wants to tell a story that doesn't have some drama, a little girl getting burned in a house. You've got to have some sort of conflict at some point to have a good narrative. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to go back and we're going to look at the very next scene in the story, the story of sin, the fall of man. So where should we go to start there? That's right, John chapter 11. <laughs> so, right. I got you two weeks in a row with the same joke. That means so John 11 is a very famous story. It's the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. We're not going to go all the way through it, because I just want to give you a glimpse before we dive into the story a little tiny glimpse that we've been given about how God feels about this conflict that come up, that came up. Now here's what's going on in John chapter 11. Mary and Martha, the very unbelievably lifted up women that John tells us about, that change roles kind of throughout their stories as they interact with Jesus. Their brother Lazarus has died and Jesus has taken his time with his disciples and because he heard that he was sick and he waited and Lazarus died and then they run out and they meet him and they're all upset and he, he goes on this great, beautiful thing about how he's the resurrection and the life and they're going, we get it. At the end of time, he's going to be resurrected and he's going, just, just believe. But I want to get to the human kind of emotional part of the story when Jesus comes to the tomb of Lazarus. This is 11, verse 30. Whoop, that's a little bit too far back. Let's start in verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, Martha had already been talking to Jesus. But she starts out with somewhat of an accusation, like, you could have saved him. I mean, I have enough faith in you to know that you who have touched unclean lepers and healed them and, and given sight to blind, you could have healed my brother. Why didn't you show up? And so you can kind of feel the drama unfolding. It says, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, it says, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. 
Now, this is, I've shared this before. This is a very loose translation. The real Greek word here was that he was deeply indignant. He was ticked off. It's very strange. And one of the reasons I love John 11 is because it's a very neat microcosm where we see the full divinity, the power of God squeezed into skin and bones, and the full humanity, the emotional side. Now, when you first hear that he's indignant, you think, well, that doesn't sound like the loving God. But you have to understand, he looks around, he sees people weeping at death. He's looking directly at the result of sin in the world. And he's starting to get angry. It's not the last time that word is used. It says he was deeply moved, he was indignant, and he was troubled. And he says, where have you laid him? Come and see, Lord, they replied. And then the shortest verse in the whole Bible, Jesus wept. How great is it that our God weeps with us? That's really good news. I hope your dad cried with you. I hope your mom cried with you when they were raising you, because if they didn't, you missed out on that element of what it's like to have someone love you completely. Our God weeps with us. I love that passage. It says, Then the Jews said, See how he loved them. They could see the love that Jesus had. But some of them said, Couldn't he who opened the eyes of the blind and kept this man from dying? Now a question. Jesus, once again, ticked off, came to the tomb, the cave with a stone laid across the entrance, and he said, Take away the stone. And I start to see kind of the fierceness of Jesus here. This is kind of an escalating story as his emotions are rising. He's angry at the result of fallen humanity. It was never supposed to be this way. It was supposed to be us and God perfectly in love forever. He's angry as he's standing in the face of it. But Lord, says Martha, blah, blah, blah. It's been in there. He's going to smell bad. He's been dead for a while. And Jesus said, didn't I tell you if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Skip down to verse 43. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. It's kind of a roar. I mean, this is an angry Jesus. It's an emotional Jesus. It's a powerful Jesus. He speaks to a dead man that's been dead for four days. The rest of the story, you may know it. Lazarus becomes alive, and he walks out like a mummy. Wish I could have seen this strange scene. And he's restored to his family. Now, why? Because here's an interesting thought for you. Lazarus died again. He didn't stay alive. What that tells us is that the point of this miracle is that God is going to intervene in our life and every time death or pain or Paul Meldrum's cancer or anything we have, he's going to miraculously take it away. That's not the point of this story. The point of this story is that he is the resurrection and the life and he's angry at the condition of the world. When he looks at the meta narrative, when God himself scopes all of humanity and he sees the pain, the death, the cancer, the abuse, ISIS, all those different things that we see in the world, he mourns with us. It's not the way it was supposed to be. The story is not fully redeemed yet. So we have to begin there to understand that God shares the pain of the result of this. Now we're going to go back and we're going to look at Genesis 3 where this all unfolded very briefly. Before we do that, I wanted to kind of let you have another John Milton quote as I told you earlier. Now this is interesting because John Milton writes 12 books in his epic poem Paradise Lost. And he writes an intro to Book 9, and that's the story. Book 9 is where the actual fall of man takes place, which is kind of more to the story than what happened in Genesis 3. But he writes the intro to, chap to Book 9 like this, and he's kind of speaking as narrator about how he's about to shift gears, because he's been writing poetically and beautifully about the unbelievable relationship of this beautifully created Adam and Eve. Here's Milton's quote as he transitions. He says, No more of talk where God or angel guests with man. As with his friend, familiar, used to sit indulgent and with him partake rural repasts, permitting him the while venial discourse unblamed. Anybody in here get that? Because it took me about 35 times and about six Google searches to figure out what that sentence means. But what it's saying is, look, I'm not going to talk anymore about God or, or angels coming down and hanging out with, with men and women as if they were friends and familiar, indulging them in conversations as they're just small town friends, permitting them to have their just easily forgivable conversation. He's saying there's no more talk of what we've been talking about for eight books. He says, I now must change those notes to swoops. I must now change those notes to tragic. Foul distrust, distrust and breach disloyal on the part of man. Revolt and disobedience on the part of heaven, now alienated, distance and distaste. This is heaven's response. Anger and just rebuke and judgment given. That brought into this world a world of woe, sin and her shadow, death and misery. Death's harbinger, sad task. 
hope you could follow at least a glimpse of what he's poetically saying there. He's saying, I've got to, I've got to tell the next part of the story. See, so it starts real peachy and real great in this orchard, in this great, beautiful thing. But I've got to tell you what happens next. And on the part of man, it was absolute rebellion. And on the part of God, it was a broken relationship with man. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3 and look at this. And by the way, I'm not going to leave you in all the darkness of this. There is great hope even in this part of the story. Let's actually start at Genesis 2. This won't be up there. But the last verse of Genesis 2 says, Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. I think that's such a great transition to bring us to the next story. Because that's where it started. They started out naked and unashamed. And by the way, shame, it's probably in your life, it's in my life. It's not what we're made for. We're not made to be shamed or feel shame. And that's where they were, in this place of no shame. And this happens. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? I'm going to point out a couple things here. It's pretty interesting. Most of you are thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, I know this story. This is Satan, right? Satan, he's a snake. And he's going to show up and he's going to tempt Eve. Well, possibly. But you may not realize that Genesis never says that this is Satan. In fact, I would argue this is kind of in the second creation account. We talked about the two that were kind of back-to-back in Genesis poetry. In this second creation account, it almost seems as if this author is saying that compared to all the other animals, the snake by itself, and by the way, the Hebrew word could actually mean dragon, which is a little more confusing just to mix you up. In some sense, there's some sort of creature among the other creatures that was more clever, is the Hebrew word, smarter than the other creatures, and speaks, presumably Hebrew, to this ancient Hebrew couple, supposedly. You know, it's only later, by the way, millennia later, that theologians start to ascribe Satan to being this particular creature. Now, there is a reference in Revelation 12, 9 that says, uh, kind of a list of things describing Satan, and it says serpent as one of those things. And it's possible that that is the connection point in the Bible to say that this was Satan. But it certainly isn't explicit from the narrative. The narrative is saying that there's this crazy little creature, and he's going after Eve. And the early Jewish thinkers, they wrote the Talmud, they would, they would look at the Jewish scriptures and they would say, okay, what does this mean? In fact, there's one you can read, it's called Jubilee. And in Jubilee 3, it says that all the creatures could speak. And the snake was the most jealous of all of them. They could all speak Hebrew until after the fall, and then all the animals' mouths had to be silenced. That was kind of the Jewish thinking about what was going on here. But here's the important part. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? This is the accuser's voice. He's very intelligent, clever. The thing that's in us, see, by the way, for me personally, on my own kind of intellectual journey, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle, including science and textual criticism and a lot of research to try to figure out if Christianity has an intellectual thing that I could stand on and say, no, this actually makes the most sense. Most of the evidence points here. But you know what, at the end of the day, really tipped me off that there was something more than just the biological processes in me? This voice. I remember in college, I was especially struggling through this. I thought, what is this voice inside me that's trying to destroy me? It's never satiated. There's never enough. It's always pulling me away, and I even hear that whisper often. Does God really say this? Does God really know what's best for you? Does He really have in mind what the best version of yourself is, the most full, the most complete relationship, the thing you are made for? That voice, then, that's, by the way, what makes the truth of this ancient narrative so real. This is the truth that's in it. This voice exists. Well, you know probably what happened. The woman replies, and she says that you can do that, and you're kind of splitting hairs about the rules. But he says, hey, 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 he said you're going to die. He said, you will not die. You'll be like God. I'm going to skip to verse 6. It says, when the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. I don't know how many billions of sermons I've heard about men and women and their roles here. And I'm telling you, to me, the Genesis narrative is just filled with the equality of men and women. And they're both there, and they're both making this decision. And they eat the fruit, they don't trust God. And this says, their eyes were both opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together, and they made coverings for themselves. See, there's already a little tangent in the way the narrative goes. See, if Aspen had written this, they would have just burst into flames at that moment. <laughs> You know, they ate the fruit, it's the climax of the story, it's over. But all of a sudden, the first thing that happens, it says they realized they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and they made coverings for themselves. Shame. Shame showed up. Guilt. The things that we weren't 
created for. They show up in the story. The tragedy begins to unfold. The, the sad tale that Milton is talking about is unfolding right before us because they've chosen in their free will, they've said, we don't trust God. This isn't good enough. This best thing we've got going on. We want something else. Here's, isn't this interesting? I'm amazed by this with children. I don't know if there's any real point to this, but I've noticed that every human being goes through the same exact cycle. And I wonder if that's where part of the truth of this story came from. You know, when I first had, my, my children are getting a little older now, but all of them when they're babies, there's no more beautiful moment than when they're naked as a little baby and sleeping on your chest, just bare chest to bare baby. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It's a connection. In fact, it's one of the deepest connections I have to the divine in my life is that moment. And then you watch them as they become little things that get fat and eat stuff and tear stuff down and waddle around and then they start to talk and they're little toddlers and they're adorable as they learn the English language unique to our little area of the world and they continue to grow but then something happens. There comes a day and it's not a specific moment but there's a day where all of a sudden Aspen's not running around naked anymore. It's not okay for me to go in the bathroom when she's in there. They figure out that they're naked. The same process happened in our own life. We went from this beautifully innocent thing, not that we were completely innocent, that wouldn't be theologically correct, but there's this idea that there was this no shame and somewhere along the way, something changed and we're embarrassed all of a sudden and we're hiding and that's exactly what happens in the story. It says, Then the man and the wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. By the way, this is kind of, the author is echoing what he was telling us in chapter 2. This is what happened. They hung out in the garden they, they walked at night and they were friends. They had that kind of relationship. And when he hears that, he hid from the Lord God among the trees. And God called out with this question, where are you? This is what I want us to camp on and think about. And I want this question to drill into the soul of who you are. This is the very beginning of this entire 66 book library. And already our omniscient God is opening up with a question. He knows everything. He wasn't fooled by their cute toddler hide and seek game, but as a good dad, he said, where are you? And I think that question is one of the most profound moments of this story. What happened? What happened to us? Where are you for our garden walk? Where are you for our hangout time? Why are you hiding? Where did shame come from? It's very interesting. He says, the man answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid. There's shame. And then God asks another question. Who told you that we're naked? And then he asks a question again, question three to Eve. What have you done? He keeps asking these questions. An all-knowing God asking these questions. Now I want to skip over to the very end. God lovingly responds in a strange, strange way. This is verse 21. After he's gone through all this kind of very Hebrew song-like poems. In verse 21, it says, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and he clothed them. Scholars have for a long time spent a lot of energy and a lot of writing and commentaries about what this verse means. Some, and it might be true, think that this in some way is the very beginning of foreshadowing that this isn't the end of the story. Because we have a very clearly vegetarian couple where no animals were cured for, killed for eating. In fact, that's not allowed until after the flood in the Genesis narratives. It's a, it's a world where vegetation feeds everything. So no animals are killed. But some would say the very first animal sacrifice happened from God right here. An, in, an innocent animal already had to pay the price for the sin of humans. Which is maybe a foreshadowing. Maybe it's an echo Maybe it's the beginning that the way this is all going to be ultimately resolved is something very innocent is going to take the punishment for humankind. It may be the very first echoes of the later narrative. It might be the first time that Jesus starts to be kind of sniffed in the story that somebody innocent is going to pay the price for all that. The movie Noah with Russell Crowe had a very interesting element to it. It followed a more Jewish line of thinking where you had this kind of glowing snake skin. I don't know if any of you saw that, but that's what Jewish thinkers used to think. They thought the garments that was given to note to Adam and Eve were actually the shed skin of the snake. That's what the Talmud and the, and the, Mad, the Madrish would talk about. That the, the way the snake used to be was created good. This snake skin is a reminder to them that everything was created good. It's an, it's an interesting thought, but it doesn't really matter compared to this. This is what God says. The man has now become like one of us. Knowing good and evil, he must not be allowed to reach out his hand 
and take also from the tree of life, eat and live forever. See, this is actually mercy. You see, the tree of life bookends Genesis and then Revelation in this whole story and narrative because here we have it at the beginning. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is just a beautiful metaphor for the knowledge of good and evil. The problem of pain, the problem of evil, human free will. It's obvious to me in this text what it's talking about. And yet there's this other tree which gives life everlasting. And the only time we see it again is in Revelation. It's saying, God is saying, I don't want this to last forever. I don't want this broken relationship to be forever. So we got to get them out of this garden. we got to get them on to the next part of the story. We've got to transition so that they don't get locked forever, his loved children, in a state of a broken relationship, which I think that's cool. So here's the, the so what, here's the question. It's kind of dark, right? It can be a little bit depressing in a sense. You say, well, what good can we get out of this story? Now, there's a couple things I want you to think about. I, I promised you that during this particular discussion, we would also address a difficult question to tie into each section that we're talking about. And often when we have open question times, about the third or fourth most asked question has something to do with the idea of predestination and free will. This is a theological bear. I mean, you can go to seminaries and different ones and disagree and write your dissertations and learn all about it. But this story has everything to do with it. And so that might be interesting to just address for a second. Is there a truth that we can glean about if sin, here, here's the point, is sin our fault? Is this story about some remote historical couple or is it about us? Do we have a choice, original sin? Is it born into us? Are we separated from God and we had nothing to do with that? Well, here's what I want you to think about. First of all, in, in the biblical terms, there's what I'm not going to do. I've done this before when we have open questions. I'm not going to talk about Calvinism, the five points of Calvinism, or the five kind of echoing arguments of Arminianism. You can look that up on past question sections. But I do want to talk about this. The Bible talks about, Paul uses the language of us being predestined for things. Specifically, predestined for knowing God. And I think theologians sometimes get a little bit too wrapped up in the literal wording to miss the words that Paul was saying in the Greek. He was saying something like, you are destined for this. It's your destiny. Young Life's motto is almost a perfect translation of the word predestined. You were made for this. It's not so much to highlight the fact that we don't have choice because the main thrust of that story, I don't know if you missed it, the main point of that story is human free will. And if we're not free moral agents, then we're not responsible for sin. See, we are. And I have that voice in my head, and yet I get to decide every day if I'm going to listen to that destructive voice or I'm going to listen to another voice, a voice that calls me to a life that would be the best version of myself. So I think it's really important to understand that the idea of original sin is not that none of us have a choice, it's actually really good news. I want to share with you a quote from G.K. Chesterton. And I've actually shared this with you before. G.K. Chesterton is a big influence on C.S. Lewis, and this is what he says. He says, Christianity preaches an obviously unattractive idea, such as original sin. Now, why does he say that? Why is it unattractive? Well, mainly because of H.G. Wells and other humanists. By the way, humanists are great because they say, hey, humans are great. And by the way, we are. That affirms Act 1 of the story. We're created in the image of God. But part of the fullness of whom humanist philosophy would say that there is nothing bad about us. Everything is good. So it seems kind of unattractive to tell this part of the story. He says it's an unattractive idea. He says, but when we wait for its result, they are pathos and brotherhood and a thunder of laughter and pity. For only with original sin can we at once pity the beggar and distrust the king. What does he mean by that? He means that we are equal. And we are equal because of our evil. Isn't that a strange thought? Last week you came here to hear about creation and I tried to talk to you into evolution. Kind of a weird church. This week you came and I'm trying to tell you how great original sin is and how good sin is. It makes us equal. All of us, me, you, every child out there, we all, all of us, Paul makes it very clear, have gone astray and turned away from what we're designed for. And guess what? That's good news. Why? And here's the big so what. Because there is no greater football game to watch or basketball game to watch than the greatest comeback you've ever seen. 
There's no greater meal you've ever had than when you've been insanely hungry and you put food in your body. Water's never been so good until you're quenched and the cold water hits your lips. Light is never so bright as it is in the darkest of places. There is something to this dichotomy of good and evil, and I don't think that it solves the problem of evil, but I certainly think it's part of the story that we could never truly enjoy God and His goodness if we hadn't tasted the darkness of our own path. The great news is the direction we're headed. The great news is this is only act two of the story and where Israel goes and teaches us and heads up to Jesus, we find out that there is a fix for this problem. That there was an innocent sacrifice. There's somebody that took the punishment we deserve. Why? What was the purpose? To go off to soulish heaven someday forever and be kind of obnoxious Christians in the world? No. So that we can be forgiven and restored to the relationship that we were designed for. So that now we can experience the kingdom of heaven. Here, we can live a life reconnected to our God. Blaise Pascal, the vacuum, the god shy's vacuum. There's only one thing that fits, God. It's the only thing that will fit and make us good. When Sierra gets excited about those leaves, when I get excited about the turning leaves, that beauty tells me that there is something behind it. It's like a haunting. In fact, I've come to a place where I don't even like talking about original sin anymore. I like talking about the haunting. All of us are haunted by something. We're haunted by the idea that we're made for more than this. We want true connection. We want to be unconditionally loved, and we want to overflow that same unconditional love. Guess where that's offered to us? This story. This story, which is the story of the Bible, which is also our story. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to come to the communion table today. If you're tracking, communion every week is a really great tie-in to the whole story. Because what we're doing is we're celebrating specifically what happens in Act 4 when this problem of sin is addressed on the legal level. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that in Christ, because of God's unconditional love, we can be instantly forgiven, listen to this, from anything. There is no sin that cannot be forgiven at the cross of God's love. We can be forgiven and legally it's wiped away as if there is no guilt anymore. Now, does that mean we'll never sin again? You haven't been around much if you think that. You can see we're in process. There's something about the kingdom of God that is now but not yet. We're legally off the hook, but every day we've got to learn to listen to the right voice. We've got to be transformed in the version of ourselves as a community and as families and as individuals that bring glory to God. So at the communion table, we come and we ask forgiveness for those sins. And these physical reminders, these tangible things, in some way connect us to God. We, we have God come into us and hopefully fill up that God-shaped vacuum. And there's a moment where we together as family also experience individual connection with God. So as always, I'm going to pray over these elements. If you haven't been here before, the way we celebrate the Lord's table is that it's an optional time. There's actually no reason you should feel like you have to do this at all. There's many reasons to abstain. And it's also an open time. Anyone can come to this table. To me, it's the most ridiculous thought in the world to think that you, you couldn't come to this table. Because everything that it represents is that this. I want you to hear this. I was thinking about this earlier today. There's only one thing that you have to have to be qualified to take communion. Sin. That's it. You have to be a sinner to come to this table. And guess what? That means it's open to all of us. The only person that wouldn't come and take and partake in the broken body and blood of Christ would be that person that doesn't need it. And the good news is, the good news of sin is we all need it. And it's here for all of us. Let me pray over these elements and we'll share this time. God, I thank you uh, for the gift of John writing down and remembering your tears. God, I thank you, I deeply thank you, Father, that you hate the result of sin, the brokenness, the misery. And I thank you, God, that you and you alone have made the way that we can be restored for what we were designed for. And so, Lord, at the communion table, God, we come to you, and the first thing we do together, collectively, is we ask you to please forgive us of our sins. So, we confess, God, that we listen to the wrong voice. We sometimes pursue the wrong things on our own.
And God, we thank you that your grace is huge. We thank you for the whole rest of the story that tells us that you give a whole lot of space for us to come running back to your prodigal arms, God. Your, your heart for us um, is a gift, and we thank you. Lord, we pray, receiving that forgiveness, we thank you for your death and resurrection, and we thank you for this community in which we can share this table together. In your name, amen. amen. Beautiful story. There's Jesus hanging out with a bunch of Pharisees, the righteous people that got all together, and this broken woman who comes to his feet and anoints his hit with her wet hair from her tears. And the Pharisees are rubbing their noses up. They're going, Gosh, if he only knew how simple that woman was. And Jesus, so smooth, he tells Peter, his disciples, he says, Hey, Peter, what, what do you think about this guy who has two debtors? One of them owes 50 coins, and one of them owes 500. He says, Hey, both of you are free of your debts. Which one will be more thankful? Peter goes, well, the one with 500 coins. And he says, yeah, that's right. He says, those who've been forgiven much, love much. And he was talking about the hero of the story, the woman, by the way. She's the hero of the story. And he's uplifting. But here's the beautiful thing about sin. It's opportunity for God's grace to blow us away. See, the thing that I love about Christianity since I've been involved with it for the last few decades is the stories. My story and your story and the people that are in this room. Because Christianity is messed up. It's twisted and weird as a religion. We get a bunch of stuff wrong. But there it's filled. It's filled with people who have done horrible, horrible, terrible things. Who have been forgiven and redeemed. And my point is this. The depth and darkness of sin to me really is about how great God is. It's about how unbelievable the love of God is. It can overcome all of that. And that's where all of this story is heading, which is really, really good. I love the, the communion song we did today. It was Pompeii, and I think it's about that volcano of Pompeii and the, the darkness that overtook the people and how what they had in common was their sin. I thought that was perfect. We don't coordinate on those things, so I thought it was awesome that that lined up for today's message. Now, here's what I want to tell you about. A couple things leaving today. First of all, the queue tonight is one of my favorite times, so please show up at Eli's house. So grab one of those uh, sheets out there and get the address and come over after our second service, 7.30, I think. Bring any questions, because I sure didn't address much about predestination or free will today. There's a billion other questions we'll tackle. It's all anonymous. It's a great time. Also, this is huge. After our cleanup day, which, by the way, is one of the coolest things that we do to help restore Flagstaff, we become resurrection people, redeeming people to help clean up this town in such a little way. But after that, uh, the Towers Band has a concert at the Orpheum Theater at 8 o'clock. So get online and get your tickets for 10 bucks now and be there so that we can kind of pack out the Orpheum for them, which would be a really, really good time. Other than that, go be together. Let me pray for you, and we'll take off. God, thanks so much uh, for today. Thanks for the music. Thanks for your incredible love. Thanks for your truth. God, I pray you draw us close together in our common bond. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.